Hello everyone, let's analyze. So today we're going to revisit the subject of local maxima and minima and make a few new insights as we do. So let's remind ourselves what a local maximum and minimum is. If f maps an open set in Rn to R, of course it has to map into R because we need to be able to order the outputs of f. So f has a local maximum at x0 if f of x0 is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in some neighborhood of x0. And of course, if I flip that inequality around, I have a local minimum. And altogether, the set of local minima and maxima are called the relative extrema. Now, if f is differentiable, then every point in the domain for which the derivative is 0 is known as a critical point. Of course, for a function that is real valued, that's equivalent to saying that the gradient at x0 is 0, since the derivative is the gradient of f transpose. Which brings us to our first derivative test. Again, this is all material that we should be familiar with. If f maps an open subset of Rn to R, it's differentiable at x0, and if x0 is a relative extrema, that is a local min or local max of our function f, then x0 is a critical point. Now recall that if f maps an open subset of Rn to R is class C2, that means that the derivative function is continuous. The second derivative function is continuous. It's a specifically a continuous mapping from u to bilinear maps of Rn by Rn to R. In other words, once I uh, evaluate the second derivative at some x and u, the outcome is a bilinear map. Now, at a given x and u, the second derivative at x is equivalent to a what we call a Hessian matrix. And because the Hessian matrix represents a bilinear map of a vector in Rn by a vector in Rn to R, we could write it in this way, R to the 1 by n by n. Of course, that's equivalent to just saying R n by n. In other words, the Hessian matrix would be a n by n matrix. Just to remind you of what that looks like, the ijth entry is the second derivative of f, first with respect to xj and then with respect to i. So the second derivative is a bilinear map. It means it maps two vectors in Rn, uv, to a number in R. Right? Well, that bilinear map is equivalent to u transpose times the Hessian matrix times v. So now we've re-familiarized ourselves with uh, some of the vocabulary we need for the second derivative test. So if f maps an open subset of Rn to R is class C2 on u, and x0 is a critical point, that is, the derivative is 0, then if the Hessian is negative definite, then x0 is a local maximum. And if x0 is a local maximum, then the second derivative is semi-negative definite. So don't precisely get an if and only if. Now keep in mind that if f is class C2, in other words, I can take two derivatives, and that second derivative is continuous. Then the Hessian is symmetric. That is, the Hessian is equal to the transpose itself. Another way of saying this is that the I can take the second derivative with respect to i and then j, or with respect to j and then i, and I'll get the same outcome. Uh, so this follows from our... Uh, theorem result on the symmetry of mixed partials, uh, which came from uh, a week or so ago. And that's why when you're reading about positive definite matrices or negative definite matrices, 
almost always uh, the phrase is given symmetric positive definite or symmetric negative definite. Because in this context where the second derivative test would apply, we would require f to be c2, which would necessarily imply that the Hessian is symmetric. Now remember, if the Hessian is positive definite, then x0 is a local minimum. And if x0 is a local minimum, then the Hessian is semi positive definite. And of course, if the Hessian is indefinite, then x0 is a saddle point. That is a critical point that is neither a local min nor a local max. Now let's remind ourselves what a positive definite bilinear map is or what a positive definite matrix is. So if I have a bilinear map B that maps Rn by Rn to R, of course I can associate with that a matrix, right? In other words, B of xx is the same thing as x transpose times the matrix M times x is greater than zero if M is positive definite. And if I replace that inequality with a greater than or equal to, then I get semi-positive definite. And if I flip the inequality, I get negative definite. And if I have a less than or equal to inequality, then I get semi-negative definite. Again, this should be a review. So we know what, or we've reminded ourselves what positive definite, semi-positive definite, negative definite, and semi-negative definite means. So when is a matrix positive definite or negative definite? or indefinite. Now, keep in mind that a symmetric matrix has only real eigenvalues. So if M is symmetric, in other words, it's equal to its transpose, then it is positive definite if and only if all of the eigenvalues are positive. And semi-positive definite if the eigenvalues are non-negative. It's negative definite if and only if all of the eigenvalues of M are negative. Semi-negative definite if the eigenvalues are non-positive. And indefinite if and only if there are both positive and negative eigenvalues. Now, what if M is not symmetric? Now, keep in mind these results are specifically in our context to be applied to the second derivative test, which requires class C2 of F, which necessarily implies that our Hessian is symmetric. But in general, what if M is not symmetric? Well, X transpose MX still is symmetric. Now, why is X transpose MX symmetric? Well, because X transpose MX is a real number. The transpose of a real number is itself. What is the transpose? Well, the transpose of that number, which is itself, is x transpose m transpose x. So if I define ms, this is usually called the symmetric part of m. If I define ms as m plus its transpose divided by 2, then x transpose mx can be written as half of x transpose mx plus half of x transpose m transpose x. That's because this term and this term are equal from this result up here. If I factor out my x's, I get x transpose m plus m transpose over 2 times x. And of course, inside this parentheses is exactly the symmetric part of m. So what does that mean? It means that even if m is not symmetric, I can actually replace m with the symmetric matrix and get the same output of x transpose mx. In other words, x transpose mx equals x transpose a symmetric matrix times x. 
So I can rewrite the theorem above. M, just any M, in R n by n, so a real matrix, is positive definite if and only if all of the eigenvalues of its symmetric part are positive. Semi-positive definite if not negative. It's negative definite if and only if all of the eigenvalues of its symmetric part are negative. And semi-negative definite if the eigenvalues of MS are non-positive. Now it's indefinite if there are both positive and negative eigenvalues of the symmetric part. So another method of determining positive, negative, or indefinite involves the determinant. Let M be a square matrix and MK be the upper left K by K block of M. Define delta K to be the determinant of that upper left K by K block. Then if every delta K is positive, then we have positive definiteness. Now if delta K matches the sign of negative one to the K, in other words, first negative, then positive, then negative, and so on, then M is negative definite. Now, if neither condition one nor two holds, then this particular test would be inconclusive and, well, you'd have no choice but to seek you then the eigenvalues of the symmetric part. Let's take a look at an example. Let's consider the quadratic function. Sometimes this is also called a quadratic form where f of x is half of x transpose qx plus a transpose x plus b. q is a square symmetric matrix. a is a vector in Rn and b is a number. So let's give a method for computing all relative extrema. Now, by the way, if q happened to have come to you in non-symmetric form, just replace it with the symmetric part. You would get the same function. Now, the derivative of f is the gradient transpose, and the gradient is qx plus a. So the derivative is qx plus a transpose. So to find our critical point is to set the gradient or the derivative to zero and solve. So that would be equivalent for this problem to solving q times xc is equal to negative a. So solve a linear system. That makes sense. If I'm trying to find where the derivative of a quadratic is zero, the derivative should be linear. And to solve that would require solving a linear system, which is exactly what we have. Now, if q is invertible, then xc is unique meaning if it's a local extrema, not a saddle point, then it's a global extrema. If Q is not invertible, in other words, Q is singular, then the critical points form an affine space. Or if A is zero, a vector space, on which F is constant. Implying that if XC is a local extrema, then it is a global extrema, just not unique. Now the Hessian of this quadratic form is Q, which is symmetric, and if it weren't, we'd make it so. Thus the eigenvalues of Q, or the pattern of delta K signs, will tell us whether we have a global min, max, or saddle point. Now by the way, because the eigenvalues of Q, the Hessian, are necessarily real, and all we care whether they're all to the left, of zero, all to the right of zero, or straddling zero, we only really need to compute the leftmost and rightmost eigenvalues of Q. I say that because oftentimes uh, scientists and engineers are interested in solving this quadratic function where Q is very, very large on the order of thousands or millions. And there are algorithms that exist just for computing a handful of eigenvalues, which would be useful in this situation. Now remember that if f 
as class C P, where P is at least 3, then F of Y is, according to the Taylor expansion, F of X naught, of course X naught is in the domain of F, where it's class E P, plus the gradient of F of X naught transpose Y, plus 1 half Y transpose times the Hessian times Y, plus some remainder term, where Y is the distance of X to X naught. Now, the remainder not only goes to zero as x goes to x naught, uh, but more so even when divided by x minus x naught squared, I get zero. In other words, this numerator goes to zero faster than this quadratic rate of x going to x naught. That is, for x sufficiently close to x naught, meaning y is sufficiently close to zero, then f is close to a quadratic form, right? This is precisely a quadratic form because if x is sufficiently close to x naught, then this is fairly small. Now Morse took this idea a step further than Taylor. He said, if f is smooth, and remember, smooth has a particular meaning. It means class C infinity. Then one can change the variables so that f is quadratic, not just close to a quadratic, is a quadratic locally, that is, at a critical point, which is, of course, where we're interested in studying. So let f map an open subset of Rn to R. Suppose f is smooth and x naught is a critical point for which the Hessian at x naught is invertible. By the way, such a point is called a non-degenerate critical point of f. Then there exists a smooth invertible function h, this is our change of variables, on a neighborhood u and rn of 0, such that h of 0 equals x naught, the critical point of f and h of u is equal to v, which is in Rn, and the inverse, right, we said it's invertible, the inverse is also smooth, and h inverse of u is v, of course, if h is invertible, if this is true, then this is true, if it weren't a typo, this is a typo, this should be a v, and this should be a u. So imagine it were so, then it'd be true. Because of course the h, un, h inverse undoes what h does. Okay, so what's the result? Well, f composed with h of y equals f of x naught plus y transpose times this matrix times y. Now this matrix has, in the upper left k by k block, the negative identity and in the bottom right block, the positive identity. Well, if I were to expand that, I would get f of x naught minus y1 squared through yk squared plus yk plus 1 squared through yn squared. Now, of course, you might compare this quadratic term to this one here and say it looks alike except that there's no linear term. Well, there's no linear term because we're assuming that x naught is a critical point, meaning this is zero. Now, if I look at my Hessian of f of y, f composed with h of y, if I were to compute the Hessian, then I would get exactly this matrix here. Now, if k is greater than 0 but less than n, then some of my eigenvalues would be negative. In fact, it would be k negative eigenvalues, and some of them would be positive, specifically n minus k positive eigenvalues. The eigenvalues would be positive and negative 1 because the eigenvalues of a diagonal matrix are the diagonal entries. So, if k is 
not 0 and not n, but some integer in between, then I necessarily have a indefinite Hessian, meaning I have a saddle point. But if k is 0, then in fact, this is my entire matrix. My eigenvalues are all plus 1. I am positive definite, and I would have a local minimum. Now if k is n, then this is my entire matrix. I would be negative definite, and x now would represent a local maximum. Now, let me give an idea of what we mean by a change of variables. Well, it's the fact that h is smooth, that is continually, continuously differentiable for as long as I like, but also that it's invertible. So f of x is f of h composed with h inverse of x, because, well, that's what an inverse does, right? At least on, this is true on the domain of the universe, which is v. And this is f composed with h of h inverse of x. So this h inverse of x is really changing from the original coordinates of x to the coordinates representing where we're writing our y. And that's why we can look at the value of k to determine whether y is a minimum, maximum, or saddle point. And since each y corresponds to an x, the same result will carry over to f of x. By the way, k is called the index of the critical point, right? So if the index is either 0 or n, I have a relative extrema. If it's somewhere in between, I have a saddle point. So let's revisit uh, Lagrange multipliers. So the Lagrange multiplier was a first order condition for the constrained optimization problem, where I want to minimize or maximize some objective function f constrained to g of x equals c, where both f and g map open subsets of r n to r. Both are class C1. If x not solves the optimization problem, and the gradient of my constraint there is not 0, then the gradient of f and the gradient of g are parallel at that point, which means they're equal to a scaling of each other, and that scaling lambda is called the Lagrange multiplier. So again, this should be review. Now, let's quickly go over the proof, or at least the three main points, which are in bright blue. That is, the direction of steepest descent of the constraint g is perpendicular to the level set of G. Remember, the level set of G is the feasibility region. It's the only X I'm considering in optimizing F. The direction of steepest ascent of F is also perpendicular to the level set. In other words, perpendicular to the feasibility region at X naught. And because the gradient of f and the gradient of g at x naught are both perpendicular to the level set, and the level set is an n-1 dimensional hyperplane, then they're parallel. Now, we said let gamma t be any differentiable parameterized curve in the level set. In other words, the set of all x such that g of x is equal to my constant c. Now, how do we know that there even exists a differentiable parameterized curve? Well, I'm glad you asked. Since the gradient of g is not 0, at least one of the entries of the gradient is not 0 
without loss of generality, let's just assume it's the last one. If not, we can always permute the entries. Well, then the implicit function theorem implies there is an implicitly defined function, h, that is differentiable for which g of the first n minus 1 entries, comma, h of the first n minus 1 entries is equal to that constant. So there's my uh, differentiable curve on the level set. I'm guaranteed that it exists. We can generalize our Lagrange multiplier theorem. Uh, consider the same constrained optimization problem except that g is k-dimensional and output. So g still has the same domain as f, n dimensions, but it maps n dimensions to k dimensions. Continue to suppose that f and g are class C1. Now, if x not solves the optimization problem, and the gradient of each entry of g, in other words, g1, g2, so forth, is not zero, right, for each entry of g from 1 through k, then now there exists a vector lambda, a constant vector lambda in Rk, such that the gradient of f equals the derivative of g transpose times lambda. Rewritten, it means that the gradient of f is equal to a linear combination of the gradients of g, where the coefficients of my linear combination are the entries of this lambda vector. So let's work out an example. Let's find all global minima and maxima of this quadratic function on the closed disk. Notice that the way we've defined it, this is the closed disk with radius square root of 2. Now, we know how to tackle finding minima and maxima on an, when f is defined on an open set. But here we have it as a closed set. So, so we're going to split this closed disk D into its open part, the open disk or the open ball of radius square root of 2 and the boundary. What's the boundary? Well, it's the two level set of G if G is the norm of X squared. It's where I have equality in this definition here. So first, let's find extrema on the open disk. Well, we take the gradient, we set it equal to zero. We did that in a previous example, so we know how to do that. It turns out this is equivalent to solving the linear system. Two times the identity times my critical point is equal to one, one. Of course, that's solved by one half, one half. And one half, one half is inside of the disk D because it's inside of the open part. Now, since the Hessian is 2 times the identity for all x, which has 2, which is greater than 0, as both of its eigenvalues, then xc is a global minimum because the, Hess because the Hessian is positive definite. Now, since it's the only local minimum in the open ball, it's also a global minimum in the open ball. And by continuity, it's also less than or equal to any boundary value. Now, let's search the boundary for maximum, since we've already found the global minimum. Now, since we're on the boundary, we're constrained to an equality for some constraint function g. In other words, we are constrained to x such that g of x is specifically equal to 2. So, Lagrange multiplier theory tells me that the gradient of f, which is 2 times the identity times x, this 
minus 1 1, which we wrote this way. Now that has to equal to lambda times the gradient of g. Of course, the gradient of g is just this term. So the gradient of g is lambda times 2 times the identity times the x. Well, if I solve for x, it means x equals e1 plus e2. In other words, the vector 1, 1 divided by 2 minus 2 times lambda. Now, this is the vector 1, 1, and this is a constant. It means if x is, in fact, equal to this, then x1 and x2 are the same. Remember, lambda is some constant. We don't know which constant, but it's some constant. So, so long as lambda is not 1, x1 and x2 must be the same. Now, by the way, if lambda were 1, then I would have 2x here and 2x here. Subtracting 2x from both sides would mean this were equal to 0, which of course is impossible. So this is really the only scenario we need to explore x1 equals x2. And of course, the vector x, the ordered pair x1, x2, must be on the circle with radius square root of 2. And the only two coordinates on a circle of radius square root of 2 are the 1, 1 vector and the negative 1, negative 1 vector. Well, if I call the 1, 1 x plus, f of x plus is 1. If I call the negative 1, negative 1 term x minus, f of x minus is equal to 5. And these are my only possible extrema on the boundary. And so we have a maximum winner. 5 is bigger than 1. Trust me, I'm an expert. Just to convince you that 1 half 1 half was indeed a minimum, I get f of 1 half 1 half is equal to 1 half. So the minimum, the global minimum on the disk occurs inside the disk. So we've confirmed our minimum. Now, let's take a look at another example. So quadratic programming is the field of optimizing quadratic forms, often over thousands or millions of variables. So let's consider optimizing this quadratic form coupled with a linear constraint. So I have a min and maximize a quadratic function subject to the constraint that c transpose x is equal to some vector d in k dimensions. Note that the gradient of f is qx plus a, and the gradient of g is just the c matrix. Well, our first order conditions and constraints, that is the first order Lagrange multiplier conditions, are satisfied if the gradient of f, qx plus a, equals the gradient of, or the derivative of g, times lambda, which in this case would be c times lambda. And of course, we still need to satisfy the constraint that c transpose x equals d. That's a typo. This should say x right, right there. And also right there missing an x, but of course you know what the constraint is, right? It's just that. I should have the constraint here and here. So this set of equations, uh, specifically these on the right, are known as the KKT or the Kirschkin tucker first order conditions and is often written as a block matrix called a KKT matrix or also sometimes called a saddle point matrix even though the solution may not represent a saddle point it could represent a minimum or a maximum. Now of course as we solve this 
what we're really interested in is x. And well, that's all for today.